Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Hey, before you see the turn, give someone a fist bump and say, thank God for hoodie weather. It finally, finally feels like fall in Kansas City, and I could not be happier. Hey, if you're visiting for the first time, welcome. I'm Christian, one of our pastors. Uh, We're glad you're here. Um, Just a reminder to all of you who volunteer, hundreds of volunteers um, in our congregation, that tonight is our Inspire Volunteer Fall Festival. We're going to share a meal together. We're going to have some time of worship. We're going to have a little devotional. Just a time for our volunteers to be together. Allow our staff and our church to serve you because of how often you serve us. We've got all kinds of fire pits and s'mores and games that will be set up. So it should be a really good night of just hanging out together. 5 p.m. if you get a chance to come, we would love to have you here. Um, Three weeks from today, I just want you to know, three weeks from this weekend, uh, we will be having a Saturday night service that is a special service that we're calling our Chiefs Chapel Saturday night. Here's why we're doing that. If you haven't looked ahead already, the Chiefs play Sunday, November 5 at 8.30 a.m. in Europe against the Miami Dolphins. And as I was praying a few weeks ago, I felt like the Lord spoke to my heart and said, Christian, there are people in your congregation who are unable. They literally are physically unable to get up for an 8 a.m. service or a 9.30 a.m. service. They just don't wake up that early on Sunday. But miraculously, on November 5th, they will wake up early enough to watch a Chiefs game. And if you don't have church for them at a time other than Sunday, they might skip that week. So November 4 and 5, we'll have church Saturday night at 5 p.m. We'll also have all of our Sunday morning services the same. But it's also time change weekend. Maybe a cool weekend for your family to come to church together on Saturday to go grab some dinner afterwards, and then on Sunday, sleep in that extra hour, wake up and watch the Chiefs uh, beat Tyreek and the Dolphins. Amen? Like, I think think that is from um, the Lord. So just a heads up that that's coming uh, in three weeks. Um, If you have your Bible today, we're in Philippians chapter 2. Um, in our Bible study time. If you didn't bring a Bible, that's okay. Everything I read from Scripture will be on the screen. It should be super easy to kind of follow along. We announced a few weeks ago that 2024 at Journey is going to be themed Come and Surrender. And our goal for 2024 for you, really for 18 months, is that you will look at surrendering 1% of your life to kingdom living for the sake of kingdom impact. When you add up 1% of our life in minutes, in hours, in days, and weeks, It's actually a substantial amount of time that we think will allow, if you give God 1% of your time, we think God could have some impact in your heart and your life could have some impact in our world. So that's our theme for 2024, but we thought we'd take the fall and just try to get our heart in a posture of being willing to surrender and seeing the power of surrender. So we're in the book of Philippians in a series called The Surrendered Life, where we're looking at a, a pastor writing from prison to a congregation saying, when you surrender who God is and uh, what God is doing in your life, like God can really use it. We've learned the first three weeks about surrendering our situation and our perspective, and we've learned that the Bible tells us when you look at every situation that you're in and say, God can use this, when you look at the perspective that you're in and you say, I want God to use this, that you become people who are seen as serious saints, people who take your faith seriously, and the author of this book, Paul, says you're seen as like stars in the sky, like you stand out against a dark world that's not living for purpose, your life is going to look different. So as we jump into today's text, after learning all that, we're going to meet two what I call serious saints who look different, like their lives shine like stars in the sky. The people we're going to meet are named Timothy and Epaphroditus. And what we're going to learn through their story is that when we are willing not only to see our life lived in situations that God allows us to be in, with the perspective that God can use it, when we choose not to live in spiritual isolation, when we choose to engage in spiritual community, if you're taking notes, you might write down the word gospel community. When we choose to live in a gospel community, a group of people shaped by who Jesus is and what Jesus has done and what Jesus has called us to, that God really uses it powerfully. So as we jump into the text today, the first point is gonna be this. As we look at gospel community, spiritual community, We're going to see the Apostle Paul say to the church at Philippi in northeastern Greece that my spiritual community really does become my spiritual legacy. What I leave behind that has any kind of spiritual impact is usually not a what, it's a who. It's who I have poured my life into. So we meet Timothy under point number one. Paul says in Philippians 2.19, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. For those of you brand new to the series, in Philippians 1.1 through Philippians 2.18, Paul says, here's what's going on with me. In this verse, he basically said, I want to know what's going on with you, but I know you can't call me or shoot me an email, so I'm sending someone to check. He says in verse 20, I have no one else like Timothy, 
who will show genuine concern for your welfare, for everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me, and I'm confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. So Paul said, Timothy's coming. Let me tell you who Timothy is so you can know about Timothy like this church knew about Timothy. Let me give you a short, what I would call bio blast. So Timothy, the first thing we learn about him is he had a Jewish mom and a Greek dad, which tells us as we begin to dig into his story that not only was he kind of multi-ethnic, he was certainly multicultural, which means he, had, he would have had all kinds of religious things going on in his life from the Greek gods and of, you know, of, of time past to like the Jewish God Yahweh of the Old Testament. He would have had all kinds of things swirling spiritually, culturally in his own family. We know on Paul's first missionary journey, as he was going through the region of Galatia, which is modern day Turkey, he passed through Timothy's town, it was called Lystra, and he, he led him to faith in Jesus Christ. That was 48 AD. Three years later, Paul would be coming back through that same town. He would engage with Timothy again and say, hey, why don't you come, and, why don't you come help me do what God has called me to do? Um, and Timothy went with him on his second and third missionary journeys, which means Timothy was there when Paul started the church in Acts chapter 16. Timothy been, would have been one of the founders of the church that this letter was being written to. And then for more than a decade... We see him in New Testament literature being Paul's official representative. When Paul wanted to be someplace that he couldn't be, when Paul wanted to preach a sermon that he couldn't preach, when Paul wanted to help someone he couldn't help personally, Timothy was always the guy he sent. They knew this because they knew Timothy. So I wanted to give you just a brief bio blast so you knew about Timothy like they knew about Timothy. Paul wasn't introducing them to Timothy in this letter as much as he was introducing them to Timothy's faith. And he was saying, hey, you all know Timothy. He helped me start the church. He's been around Here's what you need to know about his faith life. He said, I need you to know that Timothy has been living the surrendered life. That's the title of the series. It is what Paul referred to his own life as in Philippians chapter one. Paul's like, I'm in jail, but that's okay because I've surrendered my life to what God wants to do. He's been telling the church at Philippi, I want you to live your life with the purpose of having a surrendered life. Now basically saying, I'm gonna send you a picture of that in Timothy. Timothy's living the surrendered life. He's, he surrendered his life to serving Jesus. He surrendered his life to serving the gospel. He said those things in verses 21 and 22. He said he surrendered his life to serving other Christians. Most people live for themselves. He lives for other people. And he said he surrendered his life to shepherding people. He cares for people. He cares for people's soul. So Paul said, I'm sending Timothy. You know about Timothy's life and background, but I want you to know about his heart. He has surrendered his entire life for whatever Jesus needs him to do. Now, this is how Paul started the letter. Paul said, I want you to know I'm in prison. I know you're worried about me, but I'm good. Prison's not good, but I'm good because God's using it because I've already surrendered my life to Jesus and the gospel and other people and discipleship and sanctification. And even though prison's hard, like Jesus is with me. Um, I believe the gospel. God's using me to help other people. And like I'm growing spiritually. So Prison's not good, but what God's doing is good. And he said, you can look at your life the same way. No matter what you're going through, God can use it for good. And he said, as a matter of fact, Timothy's gonna come check on you. He has the same approach to life. No matter what's going on, he has surrendered his entire life to Jesus. What's interesting is Timothy followed Paul's example, Philippians 1 and 2, just like Paul followed Jesus' example, 1 Corinthians 11, 1, because Paul had discipled him. And this phrase, discipleship, is the entire point. I hate to say it's the entire point of 2024, 2025, and 2026 at Journey because it's not just the entire point of the next three years at Journey. It is the entire point of the movement of the kingdom of God. So as a church, for those of you really brand new, we spent three years, more than 125 messages, studying the 28 chapters of the book of Matthew. We spent three years learning about Jesus, listening to Jesus teach, watching Jesus do miracles. We spent enough time with Jesus to believe he was God's savior. We watched him be crucified, buried, and raised again. Like, by the time we got done with Matthew, we're like, all right, we're Jesus people. Jesus, what do you want us to do as your people? There's 1,071 verses in the book of Matthew. The last two, verse 1,070 and verse 1,071, tell us the purpose of being a Jesus person. And what we learn is that the primary and most important ministry purpose of every follower of Jesus is to reproduce your faith in someone else. So Paul says, I've become like Jesus. 
Timothy's become like me, because that's what Christians do. The primary and most important ministry of every follower of Jesus is to reproduce your faith in someone else. 1,071 verses in Matthew, 1,070, 1,071 say this. Jesus said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus gets to the very end and says, here's the big idea. Go take what's happened in you and help it happen in other people too. Period. That is the point of Christianity. And the Apostle Paul says, I've been pouring into Timothy, and Timothy is now like me. What's really, really cool about the Apostle Paul, if you study like Christian history, The Apostle Paul was the most impactful church planter in the history of planet Earth. But he did not want to be remembered for his church plants. When you read his letters, he said, I want to be remembered for my church planters. Not what I planted, but who I planted. He said, I don't want to be remembered for the church at Ephesus. Big church, great church. I want to be remembered for Timothy. He's the pastor. He didn't say, I've got a big old church in Crete. He said, no, Titus is a pastor who I've produced who's like ministering now in Crete. Anytime you read, read Paul's letters, more than 50 times he gives the names of people that he has been developing and pouring into spiritually. If you were to ask the apostle Paul, what is your spiritual legacy? He would have said, it's not a what, it's a who. And he would have begun to list the names of people. At the very top of that list would have been Timothy. He would have said, nobody is more like me and Jesus in me than Timothy. He used the words in scripture, nobody else is like him. It's the Greek word isosukos. It literally means equal sold. He said, if everyone that I have poured into, nobody has become a carbon copy of my soul more than Timothy. I have spent so much time pouring what God has poured into me into him that like we're the same now. I think if you were to draw some of your spiritual blood to pull out your spiritual DNA, that there would be two dominant strains of spiritual DNA in your blood. As a follower of Jesus, you'd have a really strong strain of Holy Spirit in your DNA that kept you alive spiritually. But if you've been discipled, and not everyone has, but if you've been discipled, you would see attached to this Holy Spirit strain would be the spiritual strain of your mentor's spiritual DNA. And for those of you who have been discipled, when the Holy Spirit speaks to you, it's usually in the voice of your spiritual mentor. Like it's the Holy Spirit's words, but you hear that middle school coach who cared about you and was the first person to tell you about Jesus, like same vernacular tone, language that they use. Or maybe it was that fifth grade drama teacher that helped you understand your skill and the arts. Or maybe it was one of your Sunday school teachers in third grade. Or maybe it's your grandma who prayed with you every time you stayed with her before you went to bed. Like, As the Holy Spirit speaks to us, if you've been discipled, the Holy Spirit often speaks with the tone and voice of your spiritual mentor. Paul said, Timothy and me, we have the exact same soul. Yes, it is the Holy Spirit, but because God has called me to reproduce my faith, I have reproduced myself in Timothy. Two questions. For those of you who have had someone disciple you, whose spiritual DNA resides in your heart? The things that were important to them and they taught you to do are still important to you and you're still doing. For those of you who are followers of Jesus, who are you reproducing? Who cares about similar things spiritually that you do because they respect you? Who, when the Holy Spirit speaks to them, it usually speaks in your tone of voice because you've spent so much time reproducing yourself in them. See, as we talk about surrendering this thought of living on our own and living in spiritual isolation, Paul says we can't live in spiritual isolation because our calling is reproduction and our legacy is who we reproduce. Like if you ask Paul, what are you most proud of? Again, it wouldn't be a what, it would be a who. So who are you reproducing in your faith? Jesus said in Matthew 10, 25, that discipleship could be seen as pretty simple. Students become like their teachers and servants become like their masters. What is discipleship 101? You find someone and you become like them spiritually. First part of the verse. Second part of the verse, you see Jesus as your master and you serve him. Now, I'll be really, really honest. Not just, not just Americans, but I think even American Christians don't like the last four words of Matthew 10, 25. We don't like to think of ourselves as servants of anybody. 
And we certainly do not want to give someone permission to be a master. But Jesus said, here's discipleship. You make Jesus your master and you serve him. And then you get a teacher who's ahead of you and you become like them. That's the process. Your spiritual community becomes your spiritual legacy that way. My hope is if you're in here and you are not reproducing your faith, my hope is not that you'll be convicted and you'll go home this week thinking, I guess I'm a spiritual loser. My hope this week is that you'll go home and you'll think, who should be my Timothy? No, I'm not doing this, but I'm not doing this yet. That doesn't mean I can't. So who in my life is supposed to be my Timothy? I think I can give you tips on who to look for. Because as Paul first met Timothy, what we find out is Paul saw the spirit of the surrendered life in Timothy before he called him to the legacy of the surrendered life in ministry. Paul, on all these trips, was looking at people who were already sacrificing, already committed, people who thought of Jesus and the gospel as more important than themselves. He was trying to figure out who's already in that I can just help take their next step. And here was Paul's process with Timothy, uh, and I wish I could leave out the gory details, but this, I just have to explain some of them for context. So in Acts chapter 14, we'll study the book of Acts over the next two years, starting in January, so we'll be there eventually. But in Acts chapter 14, Paul ends up in Lystra. He meets his young kid, Timothy, and he leads him to Jesus. Jewish mom, Greek dad. In Acts chapter 15, so Acts chapter 14 is 48 A.D., Acts chapter 15 is 50 AD. It's two years later. Paul is back in Jerusalem, and he's fighting with the disciples, the disciples of Jesus. Say, so what are they fighting about? At that time, the centralized Christian church was in Jerusalem, and people were saying, you can't become a Christian until you become Jewish. So if you're not willing to become Jewish, then you can't become a Christian. And Paul's like, that's not true. That is, that's not the gospel. That's not what Jesus says. And very specifically, they were trying to make people outwardly Jewish in what they did in their customs and how they dressed and in holidays that they celebrated and the things that they ate and they touched and they did and they didn't. So Paul goes to Jerusalem to have it out with Jesus' disciples to say, you cannot make like, I'm in Greece, I'm in Italy, I'm in Europe, I'm in Turkey. You can't make all these Gentiles become Jews before they become Christians. That's not the way it works. So they have this fight and they agree with Paul. The biggest single issue was the sign that said someone came from Jewish stock heritage, which was the sign of circum circumcision for every Jewish boy that said, I have been born through Jewish seed and I will pass on Jewish seed. This was the big one, that if you're a Gentile and you become a, Christ become a Christian, you have to become Jewish first, which means you have to be circumcised, and, and then you can become a Christian. I'm not sure how they checked this at churches at the door, but I'm glad that we don't do anything even like near to that, because that would be awkward. Um, so like Paul's like, they shouldn't have to do this to become a Christian, and the committee agrees, you're right. Yeah, you're right. Uh, we don't want to do that. So they literally put all these letters in Paul's hand, and they said, take a letter to every church that says, hey, we talked to Paul. You don't have to become Jewish in order to become Gentile. Um, just do this. Don't eat food that's been sacrificed to idols. Don't, um, don't live in sexual immorality. Don't eat meat that still has the blood in it. These things are really important in Jewish culture. Don't do those, don't do those things we think it will honor God, but you don't have to become Jewish to become a Christian. So Paul takes these letters back to all these churches, Lystra, Derby's, passing them out one at a time. He gets to Timothy's town and gives them the letter that says, you don't have to be Jewish to become a Christian. But then he meets Timothy and says, you should come on my mission trip with me and help me minister to people. And in Acts 16, it says that he made Timothy get circumcised, and then he went with him to minister. It's like, come out. Didn't he have a letter to Timothy's church that said Timothy didn't have to do that? yes. He had a letter saying Timothy did not have to do that to be a Christian. But Paul looked at him and said, because your mom is Jewish and because we're ministering to Jewish people, you would be more effective if you were willing to do this. And Timothy said, whatever it takes for God to use me. See, Paul met in Timothy someone who wasn't saying, what can I get from God? He was saying, what can I give God? He met someone in Timothy who wasn't saying, it's all about me. He was saying, it's all about what God has called me to do. He met someone in Timothy who he said, you don't have to do this to be a Christian. But if you do this, you'll be a more effective Christian. And Timothy's like, whatever it takes for God to use me, I will do. I'm not looking for the least amount that I can give God. I want God to have everything. Paul says, I can help a kid like that. I say that to say, who in your life already has that mindset? 
You've been watching them. You can tell they want to be used by God. You can tell they're willing to sacrifice. You can tell they're willing to surrender. You can tell they're willing to commit. If you will find that person who's willing to have moments of surrender and call them to a legacy of surrender, you can be reproductive in your faith. It's interesting because the first thing Paul saw Timothy do was surrender. And then almost 20 years later, he writes him the last letter that he'll ever write in our Bible. And the last thing he's telling Timothy is, keep surrendering. Look at 2 Timothy 2, verses 20 through 22. In a large house, there are articles not only of gold and silver, but of wood and clay. Some are for special purposes and some are for common use. Those who cleanse themselves from the latter will be made instruments for special purposes, made holy, useful to the master, and prepared to do any good work. Flee the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. What is he saying? He's saying, Timothy, continue to surrender. Continue to surrender for continued impact. Here's how you know if you have someone in your life who is discipling you and they take it seriously. They will continue to ask you to surrender for the sake of the gospel. They'll always be saying, I've been watching your life. I think you could cut that out. I think you could add that in and it'd make you more effective. I've been watching your life. I think if you ran from that and you ran to that, you could be more effective. When we look at why we live in gospel community, it is because spiritual community is our legacy. And the key thought is this. We surrender our spiritual isolation so we can call out and lead forward other Christians to multiply our spiritual impact. Maybe to say it another way, we pour into others so they can do what we are not able to, but we wish we could. Paul says in verse 24, my heart is to be able to come to you personally. My reality is I can't because I'm in jail. My heart is to do this myself. My reality is that I cannot but it will get done because Timothy will do it because I've been discipling someone. Who will do things spiritually you'd like to do but can't do because you're only one person? But because you've poured into them, the kingdom will continue to be reproduced. I was at Liberty University last week in some meetings where my son is a senior and I was in a meeting with uh, the dean of the School of Divinity who used to be, he was one of my professors 25 years ago when I was a student ministry major there. And as he was talking about ministry and church planning, some things they're doing in their divinity school. I just thought about him, Dr. Temple, and I thought about how many people every week around the world were being ministered to because he ministered to students and developed students who wanted to go into the ministry. And I thought, man, 25 years ago, he was pouring into me, so for 25 years, I'd do ministry in Kansas City. And I thought today, he's still now pouring into my son. My son is a student ministry director at a a little church called New Beginnings Baptist Church in Alta Vista, Virginia. Couple hundred people, couple dozen people in his student ministry. I think, man, every Sunday, Dr. Temple was ministering through my son 25 years after me to these kids in Alta. He'll never meet them, but because of what he's done with my son, he'll minister to them. And every Sunday in Kansas City, he's ministering to people in Kansas City who he'll never meet, but he'll minister to because he poured into me. I know every one of us in here want to do more for Jesus than we're doing. One of the easiest ways to do that is to pour into somebody who will multiply your efforts. That's the thought of why we don't live in spiritual isolation. We pour into others so they can do what we'd like to do, but we cannot do on our own. Secondly, as we keep going through the text, we're going to see that my spiritual community is not just my spiritual legacy. Number two, my spiritual community should serve as my timely ministry. Look at verses 25 through 30. We'll talk through truth, and then we'll talk through reality. It says, but I think it's necessary to send back to you Epaphroditus, my brother, co-worker, and fellow soldier, who's also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you, and he's distressed because you heard he was ill. Indeed, he was ill. He almost died. But God had mercy on him, and not him only, but also on me, to spare sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I'm all the more eager to send him so that when you see him again, you may be glad and I may have less anxiety. So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. I wish I could give you a bio blast on Epaphroditus. Can't. We literally know nothing about him. We don't know his mom's name. We don't know his dad's name. We don't know their ethnicities. We really don't even know the city he was born in. We don't know when he became a Christian. We don't know what his job in life was. We know nothing about the man, but we can learn a ton from the Christian that he is. You say, how is that? Look at verse 25. Paul says four things about Epaphroditus. He said, he's my brother, 
So he's my spiritual family. He's my coworker. We're on mission together. He's my fellow soldier. He's helping me do hard things spiritually. And he's taking care of my needs. First three of those are in one category. The last one's in a different category. Here's what you need to understand. Followers of Jesus, they do become our spiritual family. They do help us serve on the mission of Jesus together. But they do this until it's time to serve the mission of Jesus to one another. And then our spiritual family and our spiritual soldiers and our spiritual kind of shoulder-to-shoulder missionaries, all of a sudden they turn towards each other and they make sure that you are taken care of. It's interesting because Paul said spiritual community, gospel community, does ministry together until they need to do ministry to one another. Now, throw that line back up on the screen, guys, if you would, real quick. Most people who come to Journey come for one of these two reasons. A lot of times when someone visits our church for the first time, it's for the last sentence. They need the mission of Jesus to serve them. Their life is falling apart. Their marriage is falling apart. Their kids are falling apart. We are often the last resort, and we're a really good option. Not because of Journey, but we know a guy at Journey named Jesus. And he holds things together that are falling apart. Amen? So if you're here today as a last resort, and you walked in because you need someone to help you, you came to the right place. Not because I can help you, but I know a guy. And he does like tremendous ministry in the broken hearts of broken people that feel like they're breaking down completely. But the other reason people come, throw that back up there if you would one more time. The other reason people come is because they want to live on, G- on mission for Jesus and they're trying to figure out where can I get engaged that's doing in my city, in my community and around the world what I think churches should do. Most people come for one of those two reasons. But for gospel community to be healthy, it has to serve both those reasons. It has to live on mission together and it has to help people when they're hurting. Now sadly... A lot of people will come into church because their lives are falling apart and a church will help them get back on track, but they will never then turn and serve on mission with that church. It'll always be about them. And when they're healthy again, they'll still make it about them. That's an unhealthy church where everyone's just there for what they need. At the exact same time, there's a lot of people who just want to serve our community and our world and go on mission trips, but they literally don't even care about the people they pass in the atrium. Like they're on mission in the big mission of Jesus, but they never even stop to look at the person next to them. That's a really unhealthy church. Maybe impactful, but pretty unhealthy. So church has to be both. It has to be filled with people who, when healthy, serve shoulder to shoulder, who, when unhealthy, sit face to face and help one another. That's what Paul says gospel community should be like. And it's interesting because Paul said, my helper, Epaphroditus, was your helper first. He was on your mission before he met my needs. Here's how Paul says it in verse 25. He met my needs only because he was your helper. Epaphroditus was a servant of the church of Philippi to the needs of the Christian Paul. Paul's like, this guy went to your church, and he was just serving on your mission, but your mission got to the point where it had to be to meet my needs because I was hurting. The reason I've put this on the screen as I have, and I've crossed out some of the names and the places, is this line is not just Epaphroditus was a servant of the church of Philippi to the needs of the Christian Paul. Churches are filled with people who are servants of church to the needs of Christians. Lee Summit, just like Philippi. Tom and Mary, just like Epaphroditus and Paul. Churches are supposed to be filled with people who serve the church so they can help Christians who are hurting. That's what we are supposed to be. It's not easy, but that is the formula. And the Apostle Paul said when it goes well, it helps people. It's interesting because this was not an easy ministry for Epaphroditus to do. To give you some timelines, so in 51 AD, Paul founds the church at Philippi. He's there for less than three months. He might have preached 10 times and they establish this church and it becomes a great church. And then he leaves and he goes to a city called Corinth and stays there for 18 months. Five years later, Acts 20 says he stopped by for a couple weeks. He was on his way from Greece to Jerusalem. And he's like, let's stop at Philippi and see how they're doing. So he may have preached two or three Sundays as 56 AD. I say that to say it's very possible he not only had never met Epaphroditus, 
He probably hadn't shared very many meals with him. They probably weren't real close. They may have never met at all. Now it's 12 to 15 years later, AD 63 to AD 67, and Paul's in prison in Rome, and the church at Philippi says, hey, Paul's hurting. Anybody willing to go help him? And Epaphroditus says, I'll go. Not an easy trip. If you remember the map I showed you in the first sermon of the series, throw that up there, guys, if you would. The city of Rome where Paul was in prison, by the most direct route through the heel of Italy, across by boat through Macedonia, would be about 850 miles. If you can think Kansas City to Grand Junction, Colorado, somebody was asked to sign up, not to fly, not to drive, not to take the train, but probably to walk. A little bit of trains, planes, automobiles, maybe a little bit of a donkey, maybe a little bit of a boat, probably a lot of time on your feet. We need someone to go, and not just go, but to go and come back. Because you serve our church, and someone connected to our church is hurting, it's time to stop everything to help them. And Epaphroditus says, um, I'll do it. I'll go. And now Paul says, I'm really grateful he came, but I got to send him back. Because he was serving me, but now it seems to be more important that he serve you. And in verses 27 and 28, he said, I'm glad he served me, but now it's time for him to serve you. Epaphroditus was the servant of the church to Paul, but now he becomes a servant of Paul to the church because they were concerned about him. Paul said he got so sick he almost died. Everyone freaked out. And I know now you won't have peace until you see that he's okay. And he's worried that you're worried. So he was serving me, but now it's time for him to serve you. So almost, so almost send him back. 1,700 miles one way uh, because you, you need him now more than I do. You say, well, who was helping Paul? Great question. Good answers. Do you know in this same string of letters, Paul wrote four letters from this prison that we have right in our own the Bible that to one of them, he thanked a church for sending a friend named Tychicus. Same journey, except a little further. Do you know in one of them, he thanked a church for allowing him to borrow a friend named Onesimus. A little further. Do you know in another one, he thanked a church for sending Epaphras to check on him and see how he was doing a little further even from Philippi? Do you know that one of the people he mentioned came from Jerusalem? So you can add about another thousand miles on that. Paul said, I'm going to be good because everyone that I've been pouring into the last 20 years sees that I'm hurting and they've stopped and now they're pouring into me. Paul said, I spent my whole life investing in spiritual community and now that I need it, they're investing in me. The gap with a lot of people who need help from a church is that a church is a place you come to for help, but the way a church helps is through people. And a lot of people have not invested any people time in a church, yet they need a church to invest people time in them. It would be like one of you calling your bank tomorrow and say, you know what, I've just been looking at life and I've decided I'm gonna retire early. So. I'd like to, you know, maybe get about 80000 a year for the next 30 years. Here's my accounts. Can you kind of set that up? And the banker's saying, um, you don't have any money on deposit with us. Like, yeah, but don't banks give money to people? Like, no. Banks hold money that people give us, and then we give it back to them. For you to request money from a bank, you've not invested anything, and it's, it's hard for us to give back to you what you've never given to us. A lot of people have chosen to live in spiritual isolation until they need spiritual community. And then they call up the church to receive an investment on what they've not deposited and it's really, really hard because nobody knows you. Nobody knows you enough to love you. Nobody knows your situation. As our church, which started in my living room with 15 people, then grew to a couple hundred and then grew to a couple thousand as we moved into this building and our church grew to roughly 3,500 to 4,000 people who come once a month. We thought, man, we've gotta help our church understand how to care for one another, or they'll never be cared for at all because there's not enough of us to care for everyone. We met with a ministry strategist and said, how do we explain to our church the importance of living in gospel community before they need it so when they need it, it's already there? And we put together last year what we call spiritual care triangle that we showed our church last year, but we've really not talked about it in the last year. And we said, we need to help people understand the level of care your level of care will really be dependent on your level of connection at our church. If you just show up for Sunday morning, if everyone in the room had a need, probably you'd be standing in a line of 250 people. And we'll wait till the line's done, but our level of care for people who just sit in a service once or twice a month is about one to 250. 
We shall have, nobody has relational FaceTime with each other. We told people, if you get engaged in one of our ministries, we actually staff our church this way. Best practices for a church say that uh, a full-time minister at a church can pastor 87 to 100 people well, but that's it. Once you get over 100, there's not, there, it's hard for one guy to know, love, and pastor more than 100 people. So we actually, we have about 40 people now on our ministry team, to about 4,000 people who call Journey Home. We think if they're engaged in ministry of some type, one of our people should know them. They, if they come, do more than come on Sunday, they should be known for some, by somebody who works for our church. But man, they are far better cared for if they're in a serve group, if they're a greeter, if they're an usher, if they serve in the parking lot, if they put flags out, if they help make coffee, if they work with kids, then probably when they walk through the door, it's gonna be more like one to 20. There's gonna be a lot of people who know them, are aware of them, are aware of their family. The best way for people to really be known and cared for would be in what we call our discipleship groups, our small groups. Then you're kind of sitting with the same 12 people, 10 to 12, eight to 10 to 12 people, every Tuesday night, every Wednesday night, every Thursday night, when you miss, um, they're aware and they jump on it immediately. This is kind of not a discipleship group. I've got a football text group of guys that all day Saturday during college football season are blowing guys up. We literally send hundreds of text messages every Saturday watching football together. The one we got this morning at 7 a.m. was from one of our guys letting us know that his dad had died at 5.35 a.m. And instantly that football group became a care group. Text after text after text after text. Already living in relationship. Now it's time to really care in that relationship. But it's because we'd already been living in this relationship. A lot of our discipleship groups will have what we call a triad of one to three people. Read through the Bible, reading a devotional together, holding each other accountable, challenging them to grow. But we tell people the only guy at Journey who will answer your call seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days is Jesus. He's the only one who promises to be that for anyone. It's crazy because a lot of people never get below the bottom level, but they expect care at the top level. You just gotta understand how everything works in our church so that you can be cared for well. I know I'm tired because it's the third service. Are the lights changing? Or is that just me or is that all of us? It's like, I think I'm having an epileptic seizure right now, real time as I finish my message. You saw that too, right? That, hap that happened? That happened for real? That's like the lights at the Oscars saying, finish, like hurry up and finish, you're done. All right, what's my last point? I'll finish. Let's close with this, bottom line. What's Paul telling us? He's saying, when I surrender my spiritual isolation to serve with others, I should find myself being served by others when I need it the most. Now, let me say something about this line because it is a truth that sometimes is not true. Let me say it again. Is the screen working? It's working. When I surrender my spiritual isolation to serve with others, I find myself being served by others when I need it the most. That is a spiritual truth that isn't always true in churches. It's not been true for some of you when you needed it the most. It's not been true for some of your parents when they needed it the most. It's not been true for some of your kids when you need it the most. It's not been true for me when I've always needed it. And it's not been true of people in my life when they need me. The question is, do we choose to live in spiritual isolation because we've been disappointed? As I asked God that question this week, God, what do I say to people who were abandoned when they needed their people the most. God said, remind them to look at Jesus. Because when he needed his people the most, he hung on a cross by himself. But when he was buried and he came out of that tomb, he did not run from his spiritual community, he ran to them. He said, you can do better, let me help you. Tell them to look at Paul. One of the people who visited Paul in this prison was a guy named John Mark, who in Acts chapter 13, when Paul got sick, chose to go home instead of helping Paul. And Paul said, that guy's never allowed my ministry, near my ministry again, because he abandoned me. 20 years later, Paul not only continued to live in spiritual community, despite spiritual disappointment, he lived in community with the exact same guy. We're never told when and how they hashed out their disappointment. But at some point, some people must have apologized, some people must have trusted, some people must have said, let's try again. And Paul in prison is like, hey, the guy who abandoned me, have him come, because he means a lot to me spiritually. It's better when he's here. For those who have been let down, um, you're not alone. 
but God's best practice is still to live in gospel community. It is your legacy. Not what you do, but who. And it should be, not always, but it should be. Timely ministry when you need it the most. What's God said to you today as you've kind of processed this message? How do you in your heart just need to process it? And what can you do to take a step forward? Our reflection questions are going to scroll on the screen. They're just to prompt your head and heart to answer questions about your experience and what we've heard. And then I'll come close this in prayer. But God, as we read these questions, as we reflect, Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts as only you can. Point us to someone higher than us and help us to have trust and growth and impact in this area of gospel community because we surrender living in spiritual isolation. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'll be back in a few minutes to close us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you've taught us today from your word through the life of Paul and Timothy and Epaphroditus. Two prayers as we close. One, God, I pray that you might help us if we live in spiritual community and one of our communities hurting. I pray, Lord, you'll take us from serving shoulder to shoulder and you'll help us intentionally begin to serve face to face as we help someone at a timely moment of ministry and then God I pray that you might put both a burden in our hearts and a person in front of our eyes Lord that we can begin to consider discipling so that we might reproduce our faith in another in obedience to your great commission God I pray for those who may have walked into our church today as a last resort Their life was falling apart. Their marriage is falling apart. Their family's falling apart. They need their eyes lifted up. They've not found the answer here. They need, if there's a God in heaven, to connect to him. God, if you brought them here today for that reason, I pray that you'll draw them to Jesus and they will say yes. And with heads bowed right now and eyes closed, but hearts open, if that's you, and God has brought you here to lead you to himself, because you are now convinced you cannot do it without him. The Bible says that if you confess with your heart, if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, Savior, Deliverer, Master, that you'll be saved. 
If you believe in your heart, you can't do it on your own and you need God's help. If you'd be willing to pray and ask God for that help and then commit to allow his son Jesus to become your leader, you'll begin the process of following Jesus and all that means for you. If God has brought you here today to do that, just tell him. I'll say a prayer you can repeat after me. You don't have to repeat it out loud. Don't even have to move your mouth. God hears the prayers of our hearts in heaven. Would you just pray something like this for the help that you need? Just repeat after me. Would you say, God, I need you in my situation. Just repeat it from your heart to heaven. God, I need you in my situation. So today by faith, which means I don't understand it all, but I'm willing to receive it. Today by faith, I ask Jesus to become my savior and my leader. Forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me of my past. Begin to heal me of my hurts and lead me to become who you've created me to be. Today, I trust Jesus to be my savior and I commit to follow him to help me in my situation. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for forgiving me. God, I pray for those who you may have brought here today for the very purpose of giving their lives to Christ. We celebrate with them and we celebrate them, Lord, as they begin their walk with you. And we thank you again for your word and your worship, redirecting our focus and our eyes today. And Lord, we ask all these things today in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Hey, just before you leave today, let me say thanks for coming. If you're a first time guest, You heard Pastor Jay say that if you will turn in your connection card, we'll make a $10 donation on your family's behalf to help families in our community trying to adopt children. Um, If you need spiritual care today or made a spiritual decision, it's a card in the seat pocket in front of you that's got a gray top on it. If you'll fill that out and take it to the Connection Center. Um, If you said yes to Jesus, they'd love to give you a new Bible and some resources. If you have questions for a pastor or you need prayer for anything, our spiritual care team will be down here. They won't leave uh, with Pastor Mike until everyone is out of the auditorium. Um, And if we can serve you in any way, please do not hesitate to let us know. Volunteers, hope to see you in about four hours and 52 minutes um, tonight at Inspire. Everyone else, hope you have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday. You are dismissed.